Uh, I'm Ian Houston. Uh, we're presenting the Snakes in a Boat Pack talk. Uh, this talk is going to be about how we added uh, Condor support for the Python Boat Pack, and it's going to be focusing on the storyline and the process behind how we solved the concrete problem by adding a new feature to CF. Cool, yeah. So I have a problem. Uh, I'm a data scientist at Pivotal Lab, so I you know, work with our clients to build uh, applications that use machine learning and predictive analytics tools, and I use a lot of Python. So I was using a lot of the rich ecosystem of Python packages, um, including you know, OpenCV, scikit-learn, TensorFlow, this kind of thing. And I wanted to now deploy my application, and I want to use Cloud Foundry. One problem is that a lot of these packages have significant dependencies, C and Fortran dependencies, so building them from source, um, which is what the, the uh, official build pack was doing, can take hours. It's you know, the sort of thing that my MacBook takes a whole day to do. So it's hard to do that in the time that you get staging an app. Um, so uh, you know, I need a solution for this problem. I need to be able to deploy these, these apps. Yeah, and so why would you want to do this? Well. You know, one of the, the really important things for me as a data scientist is that you know, my models, my, my predictive analytics, doesn't just end up in a PowerPoint somewhere. It doesn't just end up you know, as a report. And it's actually part of a product. So we need to deploy these models in order for them to be able to generate business value. I think that's the most important thing. Cool. Uh, so were there like, no solutions uh, at all available, or, or what? Yeah, like I, <laughs> I built a little solution, um, but it was, you know, I made a community build pack. I learned what a build pack is, and you have these three script files that you have to do. Um, so I made one, and it, it uses Conda, which is this binary package manager for Python. So that gets around this problem of having to build all these things from source and using, you know, complicated C and Fortran uh, dependencies and having to use, you know, have that tool chain available. Um, so using Conda, which was made by a company called Continuum, uh, I was able to build this build pack, and it, it worked. Like it worked for my f few use cases. It was great. Unfortunately, it wasn't very you know well built. I wrote it for one thing, um, and it didn't have many tests. Didn't really have a pipeline to build it, um, and I basically didn't have enough no time to maintain it. Like I have a full time job, so this was not you know something I could do as part of that. You didn't want to like spend extra time on writing free software for everybody, or. Well, like I did, and I released it to the community, but now I didn't have the time. Um, but there were a few other things that we could have used. Um, you know, there's a Heroku build pack, uh, one by Kenneth Reitz, uh, you know, a sort of famous Python contributor. Um, that hasn't been maintained in a while, and it didn't work first time around with Cloud Foundry. It was very like Heroku specific stuff in there, um, so we just couldn't use that. Continuum released their own one uh, a few years ago, but again, hasn't had many updates. Uh, the Python community has actually moved on a little bit. Um, you know, from the Conda came out of a, a time in the Python community when, uh, like Guido van Rossum, who's the, the sort of benevolent dictator for life for Python, told the P Python scientific community that they couldn't solve the problems they were having with all these dependencies, Fortran C, in PIP and uh, PyPI, which is the standard way to install packages. And he said, go off and build your own thing. Now pip has caught up a little bit with some binary package management, but it doesn't deal with anything that's not Python. So you can't install something else like OpenCV um, and add the Python bindings. So there's a good talk by uh, Jake Vanderplas that goes through all of that. So you know, the other thing that you know, people talked about was Docker. Oh, Docker, that's the hot new tech right now, right? So why don't we just push up a Docker container? Yeah, and, and we could have done that, and, and it, you know, that gives you control, but it also gives you a lot more responsibility. So I think you know, the way I kind of think about it is I'm a data scientist. I don't want to have to worry about operating system layer stuff. I don't want to have to worry about Heartbleed and OpenSSH library versions. And so you know, BuildPack lets me focus on the bits I want to do. Yeah, cool. So yeah, a lot of uh, people have said that it's very easy to bring in your own dependencies for a Docker container to get like a baseline app uh, working. But it's a lot more difficult to secure and keep updating those dependencies. And if you're going to you know, push a data science app or run an experiment uh, in a production manner, you are going to want that security and those updates. So that's where you, know, you might want to use a build pack. I mean, if you're more interested in like, the build pack versus container kind of uh, differences for staging and pushing, uh, James Myers and Jen Spinney from HP are giving a very in-depth talk on this tomorrow. So check that out. Cool. So James, you work on the build packs team, right? And you were, uh, the build packs team was kind enough to, to sort of help me out with this. Uh, what did you have to do? Or what did you sort of start working on? Yeah, sure. So uh, at Pivotal, we when we deal with 
kind of an unknown feature or just unknowns in general, we'll have these things called investigations or charters for kind of exploring this new thing and gaining knowledge on it. So we did a few experiments. Uh, the first experiment was just to use Miniconda in the CF uh, Python build pack. And that was basically just uh, in the compile script, uh, running the install for Miniconda and uh, basically seeing how that worked, like what changes were needed. And what this drove out in terms of knowledge for us was differences between Miniconda, Conda, and Anaconda, which is actually very confusing. It all seems the same. <laughs> it's kind of badly but, named. Things, yeah, exactly. So. Uh, but they're actually very different. Conda is the actual package manager. So I guess the equivalent in Ruby would be like Bundler, or Ruby Gems specifically, Java maybe uh, Maven. Miniconda is the package manager itself and all the things you need to actually run it. Uh, so for the, the Bundler example, it would be Ruby uh, and whatever gems that Bundler depends on, uh, all packaged together. And then Anaconda is Miniconda, so the package manager, everything you need to install it, and this whole large slew of data science packages that comes uh, with it. Uh, so that's what we gained from that experiment. And then the next experiment we tried was to actually add all the low-level dependencies like Fortran, uh, various C libraries like C bindings to the rootfs, like the root file system that uh, all containers uh, run on. And this uh, turned out to be a bad idea because what we found out was that these are very large dependencies and it was a bad idea because if we added it to rootfs, we'd be adding it to everybody's apps. So even if you don't uh, want the, if, even if you're not using the, the Python build pack, you'd have these on your root file system for every container. Mm. And then the last thing we tried was to vendor Anaconda itself into like the entire distribution into uh, the Python build pack, like the cache build pack version. And this didn't work out because Anaconda is very, very large. Like the sheer amount of data science packages that it comes with is very, very large. And this would call, if we pursued this solution, anyone using the Python build pack, even if you have no interest in doing any kind of data science, uh, would have these dependencies uh, built in. So what do we do for our solution? We decided to just port over uh, Ian's uh, very well-written, actually, <laughs> uh, Conda build pack into the Python build pack as a kind of separate code path. So this way, uh, users who are interested in getting their data, their data science packages will have those packages and their dependencies you know, in their app containers. And those who are not interested in having those dependencies are not going to have that extra file size or those extra uh, overhead to deal with. That's great. So I know like, you, know, you, you used the code that I've been uh, using before, but there was a few things you had to do to it, like a few yeah. sort of fixes you had to make. Like, what, what did you have to do to make it a bit more uh, stable, a bit more maintainable? Yeah, so uh, once we got the basic, uh, basic Conda support into the build pack, we kind of uh, released it, and uh, we used it, and we had some uh, users use it, and we got some valuable feedback and implemented these fixes. So for example, uh, Miniconda was always installing Python 3, even if you tried to specify Python 2 uh, as the version you wanted, we fixed that. Um, the Miniconda has a progress bar, which actually interacts with CF staging logs in an interesting way, in that uh, if your progress bar like, continually ticks and updates, I guess, the terminal, it'll result in like, massive, massive logs. Um, like What you see there is just uh, 1% of like, the progress, uh, that much output. It was actually overloading Doppler, and we were like, losing messages. So we decided to just suppress that output. Um, for staging, I mean, you really just care that like, the end product is that you know, every, all your dependencies get downloaded. Uh, the other thing we fixed was that the Miniconda, <clears throat> if you push your app, installed all these dependencies, and then you push your app again, it would re-download those dependencies because it wasn't using the app cache. Uh, so we got it to actually you know, put your packages into the app cache so that on repush, you're not re-downloading them. And then the last thing was that Miniconda was actually breaking our Python uh, build pack builds because uh, Ian's build pack was pulling the latest version of Conda, mm. uh, you know, which for like a quick solution is you know, maybe what you want. Uh, but for re reproducibility, uh, we wanted to actually lock it to a version because every time a new version of Conda was coming out, uh, or Miniconda, it was breaking our builds because they would probably slip in some tiny little feature that would break our sample apps and then uh, build that was green the, the day before is now red. So we locked it to the latest version at the time, and yeah. So, you know, we can actually do quite a lot of this. It's great that your team was able to help out. We can, uh, 
We've started using this with, cli with clients in projects, and we've started do using it in a variety of different scenarios, um, using machine learning and predictive analytics. A few of these are you know, production scenarios with our clients. You know, one for a delivery company that's predicting the time to delivery um, so that someone can get updated as their package is arriving. And we're working with a car maker in Europe to improve their supply chains. So they're able to predict what parts they need to order from their suppliers in order to reduce the, the cost and the time needed uh, for those supplies to reach them. And then we're actually working with another car maker to deliver warnings to drivers when they, they have uh, you know, bad weather on the roads. And my colleague Dad is going to talk about that in the next session, about how you know, this Internet of Things is, is uh, enabling people to, to save lives effectively on the roads using the, the new Python build pack. Cool. So I think you had a scenario as well where you managed to get some usefulness yeah, yeah. out of this. <laughs> So I actually got to use it in my personal life as kind of a, from a hobbyist perspective. Uh, so right now I'm taking this, uh, I'm doing a master's at Georgia Tech uh, using the OMS CS program and I'm taking a machine learning class and for one of our homework assignments we had to, I think it was apply five supervised learning models to two, uh, vari two data sets. Um, and so there's a total of 10 experiments and then for those experiments, uh, being a millennial, I wanted to watch Netflix while doing those experiments, uh, and doing those experiments on my MacBook Pro, which is like four years old, uh, kind of dinky now. I basically, while running the experiments, couldn't do anything else on my laptop, couldn't use Chrome, couldn't, couldn't do anything, uh, couldn't pull the video players. So <clears throat> I thought, how do I multitask and watch Netflix while doing my homework? Uh, and the solution was P-Dubs, Pivotal Web Services, which is uh, Pivotal's <clears throat> Uh, hosted instance of Cloud Foundry. Uh, so with PDubs, I could just wrap my experiments in like a pretty minimalistic Flask app, <coughs> push it up to PDubs, uh, let PDubs do all the work of like downloading the dependencies and actually uh, running the experiment. And on my own computer, I you know had the appropriate memory to watch the entire <laughs> first season of Stranger Things, which I highly recommend. is very good. Uh, and then. Yeah, so I did my homework and multitask, watch Netflix, and I was happy. <laughs> so All because of the conda in the Python build pack. So, so that sounds very useful. Um, we're going to have a quick look at, at what it looks like. Um, yeah, let's do a demo. Do a demo. We're just going to walk you through what the, uh, the output is. So didn't want to ch chance the conference Wi-Fi. Um, but you want to talk us through this a little bit? So we start off, you know, we have a little app. Um, I can actually go and have a look at the... Uh, this is the environment.yaml file that you give to your app, and it basically is the list of Python dependencies. So this is what Conda uses to understand what it has to install. Yeah, so uh, if we take a look at this, what are the, a few of the packages that you would say before the con, uh, Conda and the Python build pack weren't re wouldn't really be possible? Yeah, so I think the main ones here are pandas, which is like a, a sort of data frame analysis tool, and scikit-learn, which is kind of the standard uh, Python machine learning library. And so those were kind of like big problems. These are kind of from the PyData space, like that. And so yeah, so if you, if you have this environment.yaml file, the build pack automatically detects it. Is that right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So the regularly, uh, the Python build pack would use like a requirements.txt uh, to indicate that you want a Python app. It would go down like the pip installation uh, code path or route. Uh, but the environment.yaml is a completely separate one. Yeah, and you can kind of see here, like we just push this really simple app. It's just a Flask app. And you can see, I think it's here, it suddenly uses the, uses the conda build pack root uh, code path in, in the build pack. So it installs the Python environment, installs mini conda, you know, installs a few different things, da 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 da. da. Yeah, so a few of the interesting things you'll see here that, uh, you know, after we've installed these packages, it'll clean up the, the original tarballs, and if uh, one of the dependencies yeah. is, where is it? Yeah, it's uh, this one, I think. It's like 120 megabytes. Yeah, yeah, and if we go a little further down, I think there's a Fortran one, right? Like lib, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. libg of Fortran is there. So that's something that you wouldn't want, you know, Fortran on everybody's root, root file system. That's <laughs> not really necessary. Unless you're a data scientist, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you know, this works in the usual way. It just looks uh, like part of your normal CF system. And we can go have a look at what the app does. So this is, app that I'm pushing is just a really simple sentiment analysis app. It's a model that's pre-trained somewhere else in a large corpus of text. And, to, and you're trying to determine whether something is a positive 
sort of sentiment, a negative sem sentiment, or maybe somewhere in, in the middle, some neutral sentiment. And now we've got it running. It's up in uh, P-dubs. It's running, it'll take you, send it some, sent some words, and it'll tell you the sentiment of those words. And we've gone from having a, you know, a machine learning system that was developed and created on someone's laptop, maybe it was trained somewhere else on a, a sort of a big data system, and we're now deploying it in exactly the same environment um, on Cloud Foundry. So we're able to reproduce that environment using that environment.yaml file um, and deploy it really simply. So you know, if you can't see the sentences, the first one is, this app is awesome and in the cloud. Hopefully that's good sentiment. Uh, so the middle one is today is Tuesday, and the last one is I am so mad and angry. And if we send this data to the server, what we get back is the sentiment. So uh, higher numbers are higher sentiment, better sort of uh, more friendly sentiment. And you know the top one gets like 82% uh, sort of high sentiment, as expected. The middle one is kind of neutral, about 40.46, and the bottom one is yeah pretty negative, 0.14. And we can see, like, you know, it, this is a really simple service, but we can, uh, you know, change the data we send in here. Yeah, you know, we're saying this app is awful and it's in the cloud, and the sentiment goes down to, like, 0.18. So, you know, this is a live service, and you could just start sending it data, and it's responding. And we've been able to do that really simply without having to worry about all the other underlying structures. Okay, so I need to... Da, 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 da. I need to get back to Chrome somehow. So the, what we're going to talk about next is cool. the kind of what's going, uh, what, what's in the future for Conda and the Python yeah. build pack? Because uh, you know the feature is definitely not complete, or like feature can feel it, can features really be complete? Y yeah, they they can, <laughs> I guess. I don't know why I said that. Um, okay, so the first thing is to run this functionality in air gap environment. So a lot of uh, corporations, uh, you know, run their CF installations in completely airtight environments, no uh, calling to the outside network. Uh, so right now the Conda can't do that, and or Conda in the Python build pack can't do it uh, either because Conda doesn't support rendering of packages in the same way that say Bundler for Ruby can just run bundle package, um, and this is it's a hard problem for them to solve because these really low level uh, big dependencies like Fortran, uh, C library, C bindings is very difficult to both package that in with the Python uh, packages on top. Um, and install them in a way that, like, you know, all the file paths are correct, so all the bindings mm -hmm. are correct, and all of that stuff. So I think they are working on it, but it is definitely a tough problem to solve. So mm -hmm. I, I won't think be able to support it in the build pack until you know, they yeah. support that. I think there is a way of basically running your own local repo. So if you run a repo on a different server, you could actually get the packages from there, but it, yeah, that's sort of not yeah, exactly that's, that's, what you It's need. out of the scope of just the yeah. build pack itself, so. Uh, another thing that is related is vendoring Miniconda uh, so that for the cash, the cash bill pack, uh, you wouldn't have to download Miniconda during mm -hmm. staging. You know, it already has Miniconda inside. Um, so we have work for that in our backlog, but it's not super high priority because one of the biggest reasons that people use the cash bill pack is for the firewalled uh, air gap environment. Since we can't support that yet, you know, it's not super high priority. Um, <coughs> something that is a little higher priority is reducing the size of the end droplet. Uh, what we were seeing with our sample apps that use Miniconda in the Python build pack were that we were getting some ridiculous uh, disk sizes for the end droplet. So we would be you know, pushing the sample app. It would fail for some reason. We look at the staging logs, it would say, uh, I forgot what the CF exact error message is, but it's basically like you, know, you run out of disk space for your droplet. Uh, so we realized that this is because you have all these large dependencies now on your droplet. and Maybe, maybe there's a way to you know, not have all the dependencies on the M droplet, like only the ones you need. I, I, we don't know enough about Miniconda to be able to say that with confidence, so you know, we would do an investigation to find out yeah. if we could reduce the uh, size of the M droplet. Uh, and the last thing is just your feedback. Um, for that fixes page, most of the uh, fixes were implemented as responses to customers saying, or users saying, uh, you know, I don't think this is right, or like this probably needs a fix, or this is a better user experience. Uh, like just for example, when we were pushing the sample out, we noticed that uh, it doesn't print out a clean list of all the uh, Conda packages that you just installed. So you know that's something that we're going to want to fix. Yeah. So it's you, y'all using the functionality and giving us feedback that'll drive out more stuff. Cool. Where can people get it? Like, where is it 
Where, oh, where well, it's it? already available. Uh, <laughs> it's in the official CF build pack as of build pack 156. So, you know, since all of you keep your Cloud Foundry installations super up to date and all your build packs up to date, you should already have this functionality. Great. So and you, you talked a little bit about th there about how people can uh, submit bug fixes, but what if you want to submit something else like, a, you know, I was a Pivotal employer, I am a Pivotal employee, so I was able to just go to the Buildbacks team and say, can you help me with this? How does someone who's not a Pivotal get something like this, uh, get involved? Yeah, so the answer is uh, join Pivotal as an employee <laughs> and talk to the right people. Oh, okay. Is there another way of doing it? <laughs> uh, oh, no. So, yeah, there's, there's an open source way to do it. Uh, so, for the Cloud Foundry uh, ecosystem, we have this CF dev mailing list. You know, it's very active, a lot of discussion on it. A lot of features come out from someone saying, hey, I have this, you know, use case, or, like, I have this problem, and how do I fix it? And maybe uh, the functionality is not there yet, so then a discussion opens up on what that functionality should be, you know, uh, details of it. Uh, in a more real-time communication uh, format, we have the open source Cloud Foundry Slack, which has channels for pretty much every Cloud Foundry team and various topics. Like Bill Pax is on there, is like hashtag Bill Pax. Um, so it, you can definitely open up a discussion on there as well and get more real-time feedback and a lot more people jumping in. Uh, you can also do the CF Dojo program, which is a six-week uh, program where you basically gain the skills to contribute to Cloud Foundry full-time. Um, I think you would still need to be at a company that really puts full-time developers on Cloud Foundry. So, so for example, just because you have gone through a Dojo program, um, you can't just expect to submit PRs off the bat with like, you know, no uh, preceding discussion and then expect those to get merged in. Uh, like you'll notice that open PRs, uh, opening a PR isn't on here because if you just open a PR um, for this massive new feature uh, that has not been discussed at all yet, um, odds are that implementation is not going to be accepted. Um, it, it is a good way to like, open up discussion, but uh, we would rather have you maybe open up discussion first ins instead of spending all this time implementing your PR and then being sad that it doesn't get merged in exactly as is. Um, cool. And there's also the feature narrative, so this is kind of a more formal way to get your uh, feature into CF or like the, the end uh, process part where you are writing about your very concrete use cases and opening up the discussion on uh, how to maybe fix these problems, like the actual, what the feature would look like, how it would get implemented. So now you might start talking about, you know, changes to the CC API, changes to uh, the bill packs, et, et cetera. Uh, but the most important thing here is concrete use cases. So if Ian had just came to us and was like, yeah, I really want to use data science in the Python build pack, we, we wouldn't have been able to really go anywhere with that without like, driving out more specific concrete use cases like the ones he was talking about with the, uh, like the transportation uh, companies. So concrete use cases are ones that people can empathize with and that uh, other developers at other companies look at and be like, oh, hey, we have something kind of similar to that. Um, and then they're going to jump in a discussion and talk about their use cases, and it's going to be a lot more productive. Great. Well, thanks, James, and your team for, for helping me out with that. Anytime. And, and uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to our talk. You can find the code for the build pack up on uh, the Cloud Foundry GitHub, um, and come ask us questions now. We'll take questions here, but also on Twitter, I think, as well. So Yeah, that's just my GitHub and Twitter handle. And cool. Whatever. So thanks, everyone. Uh, any questions? About the like, Python build pack Conda, uh, or contributing to Cloud Foundry in general? Um, given the uh, uh, amount of external things that you're you pulling in, how far did you test that, those, those things, in, uh, in the development of the build pack? And, and what sort of frameworks are you using to do that testing? Uh, sure. So when you say external dependencies, are you talking about like the lower level bindings or like the packages? From, or? From, from the, from, uh, the, the top to the bottom of everything that you're doing inside that additional compilation step for the build pack, um, you're, you're pulling in quite a few external things, relying on external behaviors. How and, and, and to what extent? Do you uh, sure. So the way that we do a lot of our testing for the build packs is through like high level integration tests and sample apps. Um, so for the uh, example, for the Conda build pack, we had uh, three or four very explicit uh, Miniconda, like Python apps that use Miniconda. 
And so we test we, the pushing of the, those apps and asserting certain behavior on it. We have like a testing framework called Machete that just wraps around stuff like the logs, hitting requests, um, et cetera. Uh, in terms of like the actual dependencies we're pulling in, like say, uh, like libg Fortran, uh, we have to, we don't test that because that's outside of our scope. Um, we trust that the lib Fortran maintainers are testing their code. And furthermore, it's not like uh, these things are being pulled in for every CF user. Like if a CF user is saying, I want this package that uses lib Fortran, they have to kind of understand that uh, maintenance aspect as well. So. And I, I, it's fair to say as well that the Conda package manager has a whole suite of tests as well. So kind of we're trusting that level. And then, yeah, you can, because it's, the user can specify any package to bring in, there's no way we can check all of those things. So, oh, yeah, yeah, an interesting yeah. stuff, an interesting tidbit about that actually is like, uh, even though Continuum is kind of the company that backs um, Miniconda and Conda in a way, uh, Conda itself, the package manager, is fully open source. <sighs> And Anaconda is almost like fully open source, like most of the packages are open source. Uh, Continuum just really maintains the Anaconda distribution. So they're the ones who ensure that when you're installing Anaconda, you're getting this suite of specific data packages and like the, the latest updates and all those other things. But you can mm. check out the Conda package manager code yourself, so. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thanks for your time. Thanks everyone.